President Teddy Roosevelt once said, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows great enthusiasms and great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, and who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while bearing greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. Judge Simeon has had a long time interest in combining drug treatment, prevention, and enforcement response resources in a united attack on substance abuse. Some 25 years ago, well before it became popular or even appreciated, he worked with the defense bar, some trial court officials in the community to develop the first drug diversion court in Massachusetts. In doing so, he encountered tremendous opposition from the leadership of the courts. But as he, he forged ahead, nonetheless. As Judge Zemian uh, privately told me once, it is better to ask, uh, to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. The court, the drug courts, have demonstrated remarkable success in lowering recidivism rates of high risk, long term drug abuse. Judge Zimian has trained other judges and court personnel to expand the drug court concept, which has resulted in the establishment of more than 80 drug courts in Massachusetts, New England. And in one of life's ironies, which you'll at all undoubtedly a witness in your own professional careers. When the drug courts became successful, it was that same court leadership which had opposed and fought Judge Zimian every step of the way who took the credit, not Judge Zimian. He never sought credit for himself. In typical Zimian fashion, he was interested in the success of the mission, not the credit. He's a Vietnam era veteran a former naval aviator and test pilot. He was deployed during Operation Desert Storm. As a result of his military experience, he's taken a strong interest in veterans issues, which has led to the establishment of additional veterans courts throughout the Commonwealth. Judge Zimian is a founding member of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And ultimately, he and the South Boston District Court drug court were recognized nationally in the HBO Emmy winning documentary entitled Addiction. And in the end, he was inducted into the prestigious National Association of Drug Court Professionals Hall of Fame. Thus, today we have as our guest speaker the very same person who President Roosevelt was referring to 100 years and 10 years ago in the speech entitled, The Man in the Arena. Please, please welcome Judge Robert Zimmer. Thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame if, if uh, Judge, Judge Curran hadn't written a great uh, letter to the uh, National Association about my <laughs> achievements. And I think that's why. So I'm always eternally grateful uh, for, for you to taking the uh, initiative, uh, Dennis, and, and sending that letter, um, nominating me. And uh, it really worked out well. Um, and uh, talking about, we're not gonna talk about the danger that you did according to Teddy Roosevelt as well. Let me start with this. Um, we're gonna talk, uh, there's been systematic changes, obviously in the criminal justice system. Um, and I'm gonna give a little review back. It, but we're gonna talk about today is really the systematic changes having to do with substance abusing offenders. Um, in the old days, and I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but I was, when I was an assistant DA, and I think Dennis was a, a, 
assistant DA about the same time. Uh, the, the way they deal, dealt with uh, substance abusing offenders was what we call undercover. They get an undercover person, police officer from another community, oftentimes a state police officer. Um, and uh, he would, he, in all these cases, would take about a month to grow his hair and dress like a crumb dumb and all the things that you had to do in order to be undercover. And then he'd be undercover for, I don't know, months, maybe two, three, four, sometimes as long as six months as they tried to, to uh, shorten the, uh, or to arrest a lot of people, um, dealers mostly. And quite frankly, I think the research is, says that for people who use or substance abusing offenders, um, almost 80% at some point do deal drugs just to support their habits. So what happened is that uh, at the end of that period, we would have a big arrest thing and it would be publicized for the sake of the DAs, for the police. Uh, we'd arrest, uh, and I went through one of these times at four o'clock in the morning, we got up, they signed it to the police and they went and knocked on doors and arrested a lot of people, seized a lot of drugs. And then we went to court with about 40 defendants and uh, I was in charge of the drug unit. So I was uh, making arguments. And within about five days, of course, uh, whatever the community was, and I'm not gonna point to any particular community, um, was back dealing, people were back dealing drugs again, <laughs> using drugs. So, uh, and it was really, uh, I did this for a while and after, after a while, even I, uh, could tell that it wasn't working out. And, and one of the reasons, and, and I'm going to ask anyone, if you have a question about anything I say, please chime in. I want to make sure you get that. And we'll talk about drug courts at the end, questions about drug court, but this is just sort of historical. So one of the problems, of course, is that while that undercover agent was working, the police knew or found out, and they'd back off. And so the, the substance abuse problem in that community would get worse and worse and worse. It would then have the big raid and then within four or five days, it would be back to where it was, which was not very good. So I was involved in, I'll say this, in Lynn, Massachusetts at that point, there was a project there to change that dynamic. And I was part of that change. This is long before drug courts. I was still assistant district attorney. And the theory, theory was of this fellow, a Harvard researcher, and then he went to UCLA as a professor out there, perhaps about this, because of this. but. It was every police officer and every shift was conscious of where the drug dealing was going. And his theory was that the harder it was to get drugs, uh, the, the fewer people would get uh, addicted. Um, he wrote this big report and, and it, it had a lot of impact. And I think that kind of ended this, I, the idea of undercover officers uh, doing as a way to deal with it because it just wasn't working at all. Now, the beginning of drug courts, I'm going to get to that in a minute, after I became a judge, and, and Dennis already talked about this, but uh, I realized quickly that the criminal justice system was not dealing effectively with substance abusing defendants uh, very well. Uh, we tried various things. I can remember uh, uh, giving people chances over and over again, uh, but the, <laughs> the problem was that there was a lack of communication uh, between the judiciary and the district attorney's office um, and the treatment professionals. A, a typical kind of sentence was like two years in the House of Correction, I'm just using an example, suspended for two years with treatment. And then um, so many of them failed, especially high risk, high need. And now we're gonna talk about high risk, high need as we go along, but drug courts are best for high need offenders. Um, and I'm not talking, we have diversion programs now and they work pretty well. The police divert people, first offenders. Uh, but the, the research shows that the first offenders should not even just get their case dismissed on court costs or whatever, because if you put them into treatment with higher risk people, they tend to become higher risk uh, individuals. Uh, so um, the, the diversion programs that are here in Massachusetts and I, with the police, I think are working pretty well. But the big moment perhaps for me came when I was had someone and they, we had a report from the, uh, the treatment professional and it was like, what's today? The 10th, uh, 8th of December. And the, the report was Joe, whatever his name was, tested positive on, let me just pick a date on December 1st. 
And that was the treatment. And I, and I thought about it and I said, well, what does that mean? Well, it meant that this person was having problems. I found out later as I started to investigate this. And, but they didn't want him to have to go to jail. They just wanted some sort of threat in, in the court system. <laughs> and this is, this is how we work in drug courts. We'll talk about the threats and distal and, and uh, immediate sanctions and rewards and all that as we go along. But I didn't know about any of that back then. But I investigated what happened was, and the treatment person finally admitted this person was having problems, was testing positive uh, all along, and, and they were trying to get him back on board, but they didn't want him to go to jail. So they, they didn't lie to us. They just didn't tell us the, the, the entire truth. And so what the big thing was, when I learned that, uh, that they weren't being, because they didn't trust us. They didn't trust what the court was doing. We were sending people to jail and they failed. And when we talk about uh, drug courts, I'll, I'll get to that the type of treatment, why, why that was so important, the change that came about. Now we have in Massachusetts, what's called one, Mass General Laws 123, section 35. And the standard there is if, I've used it and a lot of judges have used it. If you're a substance abusing person or an addict, uh, danger to yourself or others, and there's no less restrictive place to, to, to go, then you can commit people. It used to be for 30 days, now it's 90 days. And, but it's not committed for all that time. They put you in uh, a detox and usually around 17 days, people, they're looking for a treatment perspective of what you need um, and uh, people go off to treatment. The problem that always arises is, and we find this out later as we go along, uh, that the people who go into treatment, especially high risk, high need people, and is that they're really faking it for like the first 60 to 90 days somewhere between 60 and 90 days, they have to come to terms uh, with being truthful and then changing the way they think, the way they act, all the things that go into recovery. Uh, so, uh, but during those 60 days, uh, they might be substance free, who knows, uh, but they're not really doing what's required. And this is where the difference in drug courts comes about. Now, um, as I said, we weren't very successful. I learned that the treatment people were not telling us the entire truth because they didn't trust us. And so back about 19, well, but before most of you were born probably, uh, the, they started a drug court in Miami Beach and, and the fellow, uh, he was an ex-cop uh, and I had the pleasure of going down and taking a look at it. And I still remember, this is <laughs> my change in beginning. Uh, I talked to him in his lobby. We walked down to the courtroom put on his robe and he started to, and for the first time I saw defendants actually have uh, respond to what the judge said without the coaching from the from defense counsel. And I'm not blaming defense counsel, but the rote kind of stuff that they would say that they were required to say when the judge asked them questions was totally different than his response about how did you do this week? What were you doing? What were the problems? Uh, for the first time I saw defendants kind of respond especially substance abusing offenders. And that, that was kind of a change for me. Um, and then finally came the big change because they marched a bunch of people in, in, in Miami. Uh, they just had one courthouse. And so there were a lot of people who got arrested the day before, uh, substance abusing people. And they were in this courtroom sitting behind me in, in the dock. So I looked over and there were probably 12 to 15 people. And then he was required to give them a colloquy and he gave them the full qual col colloquy about right to counsel, all the things that you know we're, we're entitled to. And, and rightly so, I'm not arguing with that. But then he said at the end of all of that in his colloquy, he says, now, if any of you want to avail yourself of all of that garbage, he said, you go down the hall to another session because you don't get that in here. And so I sat up straight and I said, wow, this is really amazing. And, and to, to his credit, um, and to all the credit people there. And uh, some of you, again, being so young, good luck. I mean, great, I think. But uh, Hillary, Rodham, Hillary Rodham Clinton's brother was a defense counsel and the uh, assistant DA later became uh, attorney general under when uh, uh, Clinton was the president. So it had a lot of interesting people. And so, at any rate, I come back and we start talking about establishing a drug court here in Massachusetts. 
Um, and it took a while. There was a lot of resistance. I'm not going to, I'm not blaming anyone. Uh, and I, my strategy along the way was if someone judges other people were not interested in drug court uh, because they said it, it was beyond the bounds of what judges should do. They shouldn't do. And I just said, okay, you know, you're not going to be a drug court judge. Uh, but, uh, and I did, you know, and I, I tried not to be judgmental about all that. But anyway, we started the first drug court um, in Massachusetts. And I give great credit to um, Mayor Menino. He didn't know me from Adam, but he was interested in the project. And he put um, in a treatment center, uh, the River Street Project in Massachusetts, in Boston, Massachusetts. He made a court, gave us a courtroom. He used money, city money, kind of courtroom. And, and a bunch of offices for treatment uh, meetings and all the things that you need to do this. And it ended up with four courts sent, sent people there and they were um, West Roxbury, um, South Boston, Roxbury, um, and one other, Dorchester. Uh, and uh, back then we talked about high risk, high need kinds of people. Uh, and we weren't, um, we didn't have the research uh, about it, but uh, when we got the research for drug courts, it turned out, and a, a good friend of mine, I've learned, uh, Doug Marlowe is the fellow who does most of the research, and drug courts are, the research done on drug courts uh, is more than any, than all other criminal justice, uh, uh, criminal justice programs uh, combined. Um, and in the early 2000s, and I was a founding member of, of the National and of the uh, New England Association, uh, we talked about those kinds of things, um, about where we were headed and the idea of changing. And we did uh, have uh, peer-reviewed research in the early 2000s that showed, uh, showed vast differences for high risk, high need. So the focus now has become high need, high risk people. But the problem is, maybe you, uh, I'll ask any of you, what do you think the problem is? Uh, if you're doing the project in new drug courts, high, low risk people do better than high risk people almost always. So the push to, to get people to deal with high risk people um, who would ordinarily recidivate at a rate probably 85 to 90 percent, while low-risk individuals, even if you don't do anything for them, uh, we just recidivate around 20 percent. So that it's a very difficult project, and that's why we needed peer-reviewed research that gave us stable types of people uh, who were being treated for a fair uh, evaluation of drug courts. But we did very well, um, uh, big changes, and uh, the, the major change, I think, is how we end up where we are now. And the, the requirements for drug courts across the country, and there's still there are drug courts in every single state. There's some resistance. Uh, Massachusetts, I'm not going to, unless you all have questions about the resistance. It came from the probation department. It came from all kinds of areas. Uh, but as I said, we just kind of plunged forward. Um, and now they, they, they're kind of accepted. Uh, I think, I'm not gonna get political here, but Joe Biden, there was an article in the uh, uh, Boston Globe that he said he created, he created drug courts. Well, he didn't create drug courts. He didn't even know about drug courts back when they were <laughs> being created back in the 1990s. But, but the response from both sides of the aisle, from Republicans and Democrats in favor of drug courts is, is immense. So let me go into what, what the changes that have developed in how uh, we, what a drug court is. A drug court, first of all, has a staffing. And it, in the staffing, it's necessary that, uh, according to the research, that at least six, uh, six areas are um, uh, represented. Judges, and some, they tried it, some judges refused to do it, even though there were drug court judges, and the research showed that there was no impact whatsoever if the judge was not at the staffing. 
So at the staffing, you have the judge, you obviously have the uh, a clerk's office, uh, the prosecutor, defense counsel, treatment, and probation. Uh, those are the requirements. Um, and it's, every single person is discussed. Some who are doing well, just takes a few minutes, but the people who are doing poorly, um, the, I don't know if you saw the, the uh, Dennis, did they see that video? Did they see the video of, of, the, of oh, addiction? No. Oh, oh addiction, yeah. Um, but it shows the, the, the disputes that would arise. Uh, now, some drug courts and, and you, the add on people, first of all, getting police involved is, is terrific because they can tell you what's going on in the community where this person <laughs> should not hang out, uh, those sorts of things. Then you have peer peer groups uh, starting to, the people who, this is especially true uh, in the veterans court where they have peer, peer people talk to veterans and, and that's become very popular. American Society for Addiction Medicine. I, I had for a while, I reviewed some drug courts that had uh, physicians uh, talking uh, as part of what went on and gave their position um, as ASAM uh, people. Uh, the, um, when we talk about the low risk versus high risk, um, I said it's difficult sometimes to make those decisions. And I found out in the first drug court that one of the people <coughs> who was a probation officer uh, would come out and say, well, I don't think this person is probation material. Um, and I still remember talking about that with him and saying, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not, well, I, I don't want to be too pejorative, but I said, anyone who fits the criteria and high risk means it was time for them to go to jail or they were in jail, uh, they were committing all kinds of crimes uh, and they'd done uh, time in jail. I said, if they fit that criteria, we're gonna take them and try. Uh, the, I had a fight with the uh, with uh, Bureau of Substance Abuse nationally when we got a grant in one of the courts because they said no one could get into drug court who was uh, a violent offender. Uh, and violent offender, assault and battery on a police officer was enough. Uh, and oftentimes that would happen. So I still remember, this is where Dan, <laughs> we talk about not asking for uh, permission. I had drug court, we did drug court, and the people who were, quote, could qualify as nonviolent, we recorded, but we had all the violent people also at the same drug court, but we didn't, we didn't list them as being drug court clients, if, and we started calling them clients at that time. So the things that changed uh, was that, that we took anyone, and, and also I learned, and this is where comes in, we talk about proximal and distal uh, factors. And uh, proximal for high risk offenders, this is a learning process for me, they continue to use, and that was called a distal goal, drug free. Uh, the, the proximal goal is to at least show up uh, for treatment, even though, as I said earlier, the 60 to 90 day time, uh, we we're just kind of faking it, but at least if they kept showing up. And I had a couple of, and then the distal goal probably is to become drug free. The, in the punishments, um, and it used to be if you got a two year sentence suspended for two years and you kept, you know, come back violations because you were using or you got a new offense, you'd end up doing the two years. And I will give credit though to, uh, the sheriff back then, they had a program um, and I would take people um, who completed their program in the House of Correction. It was a, a tough uh, TC therapeutic community that was funded. And if they completed the TC and they passed the hair test that shows they were drug free for 90 days, I think was what I did drug court, I would re, uh, reverse the decision of their being found in violation uh, and and let them out and put them back on probation and start. And it, 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 the distal and proximal goals and the distal and proximal kind of punishments uh, are something we all had to learn and it's difficult sometimes for judges uh, because 
uh, the research shows that if someone is doing okay in a program, whatever, and they're failing, that they, uh, if they fail enough that you say, okay, I used the doc day in the doc program, I'd lock them up for the day and then let them out at the end of the day. Uh, but the problem was a lot of treatment, if you, if they didn't show up, then they lost their bed in the treatment facility. So we, we tried doing that. And then uh, we convinced treatment people to, to hold their bed open for a couple of days. And the, the uh, goal of drug court obviously is to get people clean and sober. And we've changed the name. It's another from uh, the New England Association of Drug Court Professionals to the, uh, the organization is now called Recovery Courts. And it, um, it came from my meeting with graduates from years back, and they're talking about what was important, what they learned. So we're, we, we've also uh, include now things that a little few, always the same, but added things to talk about long-term recovery, uh, because that's what's important uh, for them down the road. And I've met people who uh, were in drug court and are very successful. Um, um, and, and I'm very proud of, of those people and how well they're doing. So when we talk about proximal and distal goals, um, the punishments uh, for in, in, in proximal or even in distal goals is never to lock someone up for more than seven days. because That's the maximum amount of time that research shows is effective. And sometimes it's just overnight, um, but treatment people like that because a lot of times they need something to push and keep the people in treatment, especially at that 60 day uh, pro point where they're making substantial, they have to make substantive substantive changes to their life. As I said, the way they think, the way they act, uh, if they don't, uh, they're not gonna make it. Uh, so the other issue that I wanna talk about here has to do, <coughs> excuse me, with Emmy, MAT, uh, which anyone, raise your hand if you know what MAT is. Okay, it's medically assisted treatment. Now for opiates, uh, the, uh, we all know about methadone, but there's also buprenorphine uh, and another, uh, uh, the Vivitrol is the third one. And I still remember when I started drug court, one of the things, um, that we talked about in Massachusetts is, is a leader. I, I'm really proud of that. I'm gone, I'm, I'm retired. But in applying MAT uh, in the Houses of Corrections, um, and the first time I came into this was in, when we had women in one of the drug courts I was sitting in, um, when they would uh, get arrested, a lot, of, I mean, they got arrested. And if they were pregnant, they would put them on methadone. And I still remember when we got, if they were drug court people, we'd get them out soon, uh, as soon as they got stable and we'd bring them back. And everyone on the drug court team told me that back then that we couldn't take anyone who was, um, uh, was getting uh, methadone. And that methadone was the only thing they gave in the house's correction if they were pregnant. And I overruled, we judges can do overrule my team. And we started taking people. Um, and then they said they had to be separated. And I didn't separate them out. And because in drug court, um, if you want to get the word out, <laughs> the word gets out to all the defendants in drug court within minutes, it seems they all know they have a, a way of everyone's communicating about what's going on. And so we had women on methadone and they seem to work out as well. So I've always been a fan of that um, and it's controversial. Uh, the Vivitrol uh, is non-opiate based and, and the opiates are, are what's most prevalent uh, in the Northeast. Um, and so that's why we use it. This, uh, methamphetamines is making a way into the Northeast <clears throat> but the problem with methamphetamines for the people who use it is the, the labs to make it, it's a horrible smell. Uh, we don't have a lot of open space as they do probably in the Midwest. So we're still one of the few places that methamphetamine hasn't made a big push. Uh, 
as, a, as opposed to opiates. So the, the, what has arisen, and I'm, I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but the sheriff of um, Middlesex County has been a leader in doing this, but other sheriffs are doing it. There's some case law now that says if someone is on a medically assisted treatment, that would, as I said, is either methadone, buprenorphine, or bibitrol, uh, that the, they have to continue the, the jail or the house of correction or place of detention has to continue that, which, which I'm kind of glad of, uh, because otherwise they go through uh, detox, which is a horrible experience. Uh, well, I haven't experienced it, but I've seen people going through detox and it, it's really difficult. Um, so uh, what has happened is that methadone and buprenorphine um, are somewhat problematic. And the reason they're problematic is that they are opiate based. There's no question about that. They're uh, antagonists, uh, I mean agonists, and they block the receptor uh, sites um, with either methadone or buprenorphine. And the problem of course is that in jails, um, smuggling in other things, <laughs> other, uh, um, mind changing, uh, and combining that with uh, buprenorphine or methadone is problematic. And for that reason, so many of the uh, sheriffs in across the country uh, use Vivitrol because Vivitrol is non-opiate based as opposed to the other two. But um, the problem with Vivitrol is when people start to use it for a while, they become confident enough and they don't have to go through withdrawal so they stop taking it and then they're in the danger zone again. Well, buprenorphine and methadone, people continue on it because they don't want to go through, and I wouldn't want to go through detox uh, myself. Um, so what we're doing, and uh, I'm going to give you a few more factors having a good drug cuts and then we'll try to open it up for questions or comments. Um, the major thing uh, important about drug courts is valid testing. And this means two or three times a week, three times a week, if they know it's coming. I can remember <laughs> defendants telling me uh, who were working, a lot of them worked in restaurants as they went along and they would make a call at four o'clock in the afternoon to see if they were gonna be tested the next day. If they weren't gonna be tested, they had a chance to use. If they didn't, if they were gonna be tested, uh, and they were using, they would take gallons and gallons of water and try to uh, use that as a way so that it would meet the minimum requirements of testing. I don't understand all that, I'm not real good at that, but I had to laugh when they told me that story. So two, two times a week, if, if it's done that way, three times a week, if it's done like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which oftentimes is done that way. Uh, most drug courts have stages uh, people after the arrest in the first stage usually appear almost weekly. They have to appear weekly um, and then it decreases to like uh, every two weeks in second stage, but never more than twice a month to appear throughout drug court. Mm -hmm. So sometimes drug court people, if they get a job, it become, but they have to be truthful. And if I go back just for a minute to the proximal and distal goals and proximal and dis, uh, distal uh, rebukes, if I can use that word. Um, one of the major things proximally is showing up and then the next proximal goal is to be honest. So for people who appear in drug court, if they have to be tested, um, they come in, if they miss a test, obviously that's problematic, but if they're gonna be tested and before they're tested, if they're truthful and say I've, I've used, <clears throat> then the punishment is much less because truthfulness is what we're looking for uh, next to that's a real proximal goal and it's a goal throughout drug court. And I think when I talk to graduates, they, they talk about becoming truthful uh, was one of the major changes, the, the major change, if you will, in their lives. They were truthful about their use, about being addicts. And as most of you know, uh, some of our public officials uh, are people would see them 
I don't think it's a secret, but the mayor of Boston is in recovery for a lot of, a lot of years. I give him credit for that. And some of my people go to his AA meetings and, and he's, he's, and he's there. And it, it, it help, it's very helpful, all this truth, if I can say truthfulness as being the major goal. Um, the stages in, and then in most, in the drug courts I was in, we had four stages. It takes at least a minimum of a year, 18 months sometimes, you know, and one of the problems in, in drug court, if we could go longer, but we're so overwhelmed in the criminal justice system and in the court system uh, that, you know, to get someone off probation is very helpful to the probation department. So we do that. And one of the th things I changed in the drug courts near the end, when I was, before I had to retire, uh, was we had a period, a three month period where they didn't show up at all. And then, and then they would have to come back and tell us how things were going and, be, and get a hair test. And a hair test, uh, tests for nine, actually for three months. And they would get tested, but without, and that was part of the idea of recovery courts, that long-term recovery, they wouldn't have to come in court and talk to the judge in, 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 in any way. Now, rewards and sanctions, I've talked about that. We've learned so much about rewards and sanctions in the criminal justice community, about that seven days, don't incarcerate people for more than seven days. Incarceration should be the last thing uh, that we try to do. Uh, and we want to make it open to everyone uh, based not on someone's opinion about whether they're good material or not, but based on the fact that they are high risk and uh, 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 meet, meet our criteria. And the final thing I want to talk about, and it's a big point for me, and not too many courts do this, but to me, every drug court uh, should be a re-entry court. There are re they talk about them as re-entry, and it means they come out of jail. And we, Massachusetts is a real leader in having treatment behind the walls and giving MAT um, behind the walls. And then when they get out, almost immediate uh, treatment place for them to go within the first 48 hours because it's in within the first 72 hours of people being released where the uh, death rate is so high for people who are addicted because how do they celebrate because they start using drugs again unfortunately too many times um, the uh, so when I say re-entry some people I mean I, I use this example um, for someone who is a substance abuser, breaks into a house, thinks no one's there, it turns out they're young children, 12 years old uh, there, and he's got a long record. Well, I admit that person has to go to jail just because um, the, the public demands it. But if you get them short, I, I, I lecture all the time to judges, shorten the sentence, time in, lengthen the time on probation if you can, and make it conditional that they go to drug court. And, uh, and for success for these high risk people, the peer reviewed research shows drug courts are very successful uh, compared to other types of uh, reaction of the court system. So questions, comments, anyone? How much, where are we in time? What time is it? Um, anyone? Oh, yes, ma'am. Did you raise your hand in the back? Go ahead. Um, yeah, because I think the mic won't take you. Come on up, Mary Angela. We, we, because uh, of the mechanics of the mic, uh, Bob, we have to have the phone. Oh, someone coming. Oh, well, thank you for coming up. I appreciate it. Oh, you're just talking about how the drug courts mainly focus on nonviolent offenders, just because, like, it's more of, like, the public demand to leave the violent offenders, like, give them a, a sentence, but is it, like, the whole purpose of the courts to kind of treat people with mental health problems. So even if they are violent offenders, wouldn't it be useful to put them into drug courts as a way of diversion and not to incarcerate them? Okay, I, I think, um, uh, I know everyone's wearing masks, but I think what we're talking about or what your question has to do with violent offenders versus non-violent offenders, only the state and it, it's the federal government to, for the granted. So if you have a grant, you can only have non-violent offenders. And I explained to you that I took violent offenders 
and <clears throat> and violent offenders are just as successful as nonviolent offenders in the programs. And um, when you talk about violence, so much of violence connected to, to drug use has to do with domestic violence too. Um, so we're very sensitive to that. In the, in the drug, you know, the drug, I mean, the anti-domestic violence people uh, have a voice and they should have a voice and, may, and sometimes um, for the good of that person, for the good of the victim, that person should spend some time in jail and they feel it, it helps the community uh, view of drug courts if, if people have to go to to, uh, to jail um, for a period of time. But but then I go to that thing about re-entry, get treatment behind the walls, offer MAT to them, which uh, medically assisted treatment, or they whatever is best for them um, before they get out and, and then and then decrease the time. I and mean, usually people don't have a problem with like decreasing it from two years to like three months or six months and make the other part of the two year sentence uh, uh, suspended with probation and treatment in drug court. So uh, I hope that answers the question you had uh, because there is no question um, that it leads me into the final thing <laughs> to talk about. Uh, there is a danger. Uh, I don't know if you all know, but uh, in the progress, I'm not trying to be political again, but I, I use the term progressive movement about decriminalizing everything. Uh, in in Oregon, uh, you might know they've decriminalized marijuana. They did that earlier, but they've decriminalized opiates, heroin, cocaine, um, and I I'm not. I mean I, I'm I. I talk one way, I suppose you're, you're getting an impression, but um, to legalize it, and they have these houses um, in Canada where people can just live in the house and, and get injections of, of heroin on a daily basis. Uh, and they say, it, I don't know, the research really hasn't uh, been done on it, but I am not ready. <laughs> I don't know how you all feel. Now you can take a vote here but I'm not ready to throw people's lives away in that way. I think we all have an obligation to get, get people, even if they're on MAT, and some people say is trading one drug for another, but they're living productive lives. And I don't think that we can, I can, I can't accept the fact that we could just give up on people and let them live and take drugs um, on a daily basis. So, yeah, so, when I talk about the progressive movements, if you decriminalize all of this, then we lose the power of the court system to encourage people. And one of the things I did, I can still remember this, there's sometimes sort of a badge of courage, badge of honor to do your time. And uh, so if people on a probation, especially on a probation surrender where the court has all the power because it's not a jury trial uh, at all. Um, if people would, <laughs> I'd say, I'd go to sidebar with the defendant, defense counsel, and not the defendant, defense counsel, and say, look, does he want to do a sentence or does he want to go into drug court? Uh, and in some people who are obviously going through detox, I'd say, if they, uh, I talked about this earlier, 123 section 35, a commitment, they don't even go to jail, but they co they're committed to a facility for 17, usually about 17 days, and then they come back to drug court. They start the whole process, and I got people to do that. And even if they said no, he just you know wants to do his time, I would you know continue his case for something and let him come in and view drug court and get an idea of what drug court was and it is, uh, and changed a lot of people's perspective about it. So. Uh, that's another way of getting people the help that they obviously need, uh, even though it's, I guess, quote, voluntary, uh, that they go into the program rather than take the time in jail. So that's one of the good parts. But I, uh, to complete the talk about uh, the do's and don'ts, um, the Oregon is 
way ahead of or way. Uh, if you legalize all drugs, I, I just think it's the death knell for drug courts and the courts being able in a, a sophisticated substance abuse, or I mean, sophisticated peer reviewed way of getting people off drugs or living with methadone, buprenorphine or Vivitrol um, as a way of a substitute uh, to do that. So I hope that answers the question. I appreciate the question because it helped me get to that point uh, where I think that that is a danger for uh, drug courts uh, across the state. I will say this too. Anyone else have a question online or anything? A couple other things I can say. Um, drug courts started off as adult drug courts. It's now changed, not changed, but uh, we have um, juvenile courts, we have family courts, we have veterans courts, um, and the most successful are adult drug courts. I think because people make decisions uh, and, and the people who graduate talk about, they look back on their lives and you know they're in their 20, late 20s, 30s, sometimes 40s, um, and they want to change. Juvenile drug courts don't do as well. The uh, peer-reviewed research shows that it doesn't do as well. And amazingly, family courts, or what we call in Massachusetts probate courts, are do almost as well, that would be more research. Because in, in probate court, um, you have, um, and I was one of the people that talked about <laughs> the concept of one defendant or one problem and uh, one judge, and having a judge have, first of all, the male, usually the male, I'm not trying to pick on males, but that's the drug user. You have, he's probably committed lots of crimes, might be domestic violence, and the children, or the, the whole case is in probate court, family court, and the kids, they're trying to get programs for the children, um, and they might be in juvenile court. So my suggestion got turned down, of course, <laughs> by the chief justices of the trial court of each department. We have eight departments in Massachusetts. Um, would have one judge be the probate judge to handle as one problem, one family problem, uh, and have power, uh, the criminal power to keep the, the fellow, I'm using that example, could be a female, um, in, in drug court and accepting drug court and doing well, hopefully. But then the children in probate court, uh, the family court part, sometimes the women uh, in, well, oftentimes people are more willing in probate court. And that's why I think why probate court does so well, uh, seemingly almost as well as adult drug court uh, because losing their children oftentimes is a real problem for a lot of people are losing visitations and all that. So there's a lot of coercion. And I'll be honest, we do, we coerce people obviously to, to at the beginning, especially. Um, the other court, um, Veterans Court, um, receives a lot of support from legislators and from elected officials because it's Veterans Court. I'm a veteran, so I'm not arguing about that. But uh, the problem with Veterans Court, and I did a lot of um, analysis of Veterans Courts across the country, they get a lot of their treatment through the VA and the problem with the VA and they're changing. I will say that they've changed is that they took um, placed people who were low risk and the court takes low risk, high risk people. They just take veterans, which is somewhat problematic for me because I think they should be doing high risk people, but they put low risk and high risk people. The VA does in treatment groupings um, together. And for low risk people, as I've said earlier, um, you can't put low risk people with high risk people in the treatment because they tend to become higher risk. And so, but they're changing. The VA has come around a little. I see it when I've done these evaluations more recently that they are separating and, and running um, project ahead of time about whether this is a high risk, uh, high risk uh, drug user or low risk and putting them in, in, in the appropriate Grouping. So that also is one of the problems, I think, that uh, in Veterans Court that they're trying to 
Veterans Court, though, is the big way where they have peer groups. So that part of that peer, uh, peer groups helping out in, in the Veterans Courts a lot. Um, all right, any other questions, comments? Where are we in time? I don't even have a watch. I'm in time. Uh, I, I, I especially want to reach out to the Zoom participants. Uh, Harley, any questions from you from Taiwan? He's Taiwan. Yeah. Right uh, yes, please, any. Oh, no, I, I don't have a question. Thank you, though. Uh, any other questions from Zoom participants specifically? Because I have three. Uh, if, Thanks. Oh, who has a question? Anybody have a question? No, that was me commenting. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, question one What percentage of criminal defendants, in your experience, are uh, serious drug abusers? Question one. Question two What is the single most reliable drug test to uh, determine whether somebody is, is using? And three, what are the most dangerous drugs out there uh, right now? Okay, I think that the research is pretty uh, set that between um, 60 to 70% of people who are arrested are substance abusers uh, who commit other crimes. I'm not, and I'm not talking about just being, uh, I think we've decriminalized in, in effect, not decriminalized, but people who are just arrested for uh, possession, even though, as I said, most people who are, do possess drugs eventually end up uh, uh, distributing. Uh, that, that I remember the district attorney of Suffolk County, that's where Boston is, talking about if anyone, any defense counsel could point to a person who's in jail for either distribution, lower end distribution, and or uh, possession in jail, he would take care of it and get them out of jail. So I think we we, we changed that kind of dynamic, uh, but it is true that between 60, I said 70, maybe 75% of people who commit other crimes, and I'm talking about breaking and entering, assaults, all that kind of crimes, are have a substance abuse problem. So yeah, that's question one. The second question having to do with what is the best test uh, I don't know what <laughs> they come up with better and better tests. And we, in, the, in our association, uh, we've got some, in this day and age, it's a tough day and age, and especially in, in, not in, the, in the cities, uh, but getting people in to get tested. They have new devices. And I, I was just on a conference call and uh, I forget the name of the company, but they can do wonders uh, for for testing on the spot, um, seemingly. And I don't understand the science of it at all, but um, they have devices now, and we talked about doing it, especially in family court for kids and things to, to make sure they don't go to bad areas, uh, that they uh, know where they are uh, and testing them uh, remotely. So uh, I think that the remote test done with devices is the most practical way that we're going to test it. It won't be urine testing uh, done. The, the, the devices are too sophisticated, uh, much more sophisticated, if I can use that, um, and better because they can do it remotely. Um, and what was, was the Oh, go ahead. Was air sampling the gold standard at one time? Yeah, the, the, the hair test was my gold standard because it helped me long term. Uh, get people, as I said, that last 90 days without any supervision, and they would come back and if they passed the hair test um, for 90 days, I, I was felt great. And they, I think that they were on their way to success. And it also true for when we were doing um, initially treatment for reentry, if they could show, if they had a longer sentence, if they could show that they were 90 days drug free because of the program they were doing in the houses of correction or in jails or, or uh, detention centers or uh, in state prison, uh, then that was my idea of changing their sentence, uh, even though that was 
I'm not sure the legality of it, but I did it. Uh, I would re revise and revoke their sentence uh, because they had been clean for 90 days. And that was my gold standard back then uh, because the urine tests, you have to do them on a weekly basis, uh, two, as I said, two or three times a week. So that's mm -hmm. why. And, and the hair sample, the, the drugs stay in the, in the hair strand for up to 90 or 120 days, is that, is that right? Yeah. Up to 90 days, uh, yeah, uh, it was 90 days. Uh, and even if they were bald, we could get hair some other way. <laughs> and uh, the last is the most dangerous drugs that are out in the street now? Well, I think the most dangerous is methamphetamine is just beyond control and fentanyl. Fentanyl, uh, well, let me just say, uh, with, I'll get to fentanyl in a minute, but um, th th we don't have uh, that in Massachusetts as much as, as other parts of the country. Uh, but that's a very dangerous drug. It affects their minds. It affects physical uh, methamphetamine. It's just, and we're lucky that we don't have as much, uh, although it's creeping in. Uh, but fentanyl, if I can move to fentanyl, that's the most dangerous because it can just a very small amount can mix with anything else can, can kill. And most of the people who die is because of fentanyl. Well, uh, thank thank you very much, Judge. I appreciate the time. Oh, thank you all for listening. I appreciate that. Good luck. <laughs>